Hi and welcome back to Man Talk. This week's guest is Tony Maxwell who joins me here who is a member of the Westmead Prostate Cancer Support Group. Welcome to the show. Thank you Jason. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, to get us underway if you can tell some people about your own personal journey, how you got involved with the support group and, and, and you know your own particular circumstances. Yes, uh, I had a uh, PSA test done in 2003 and it showed that it was beginning to go above the limit at that time. Right. Uh, I was about 57 at that point. So this was a PSA test, you a mean? PSA test. Okay, yeah. prostate specific antigens test we talked about on the show. You should know what that is by now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was going just above the line, so I had a DRE and eventually a biopsy and that confirmed that I had fairly aggressive prostate cancer. Right. And I had a... Sorry, but how do they know it's aggressive? Like, like from a uh, DRE, by the way, is the good old digital rectal examination. By, by touch, they, how do they know it's aggressive no, they, or it's not at an advanced stage? Or? When they do the biopsy, they actually take a sample of the prostate in right. that process. Yeah. And the pathology then is examined and that shows up what is called a Gleason score. Oh, okay. And the Gleason score for me, the maximum is 10 and I was about an 8. So wow. I was at the aggressive end. I was a bit more aggressive than Colin Bartlett's yeah. Yeah. 7. So that shows how aggressive it is, okay. and uh, from that uh, a decision was made that I should have a radical prostatectomy, which I had in May 2003. Okay, and what, what does that actually involve, so people know? It involves the physical removal of the prostate, um, okay. it's a fairly major operation, okay. um, and uh, knocks you around a bit, but um, after about three or four days I was ready to go home. Okay. Uh, you have some initial continence problems, most yeah. people have that. But after a period of time, that tends for most people to uh, to get better. Is that more a health issue or, a, shall we say, a pride issue for men, do you think, the confidence issue? Well, it's, it's both. Okay. It, uh, it's uh, very embarrassing if you've got problems in that area. Yeah. Um, there's also an issue with, um, with uh, erectile dysfunction. Yep. Um, lots of men have a degree of problem in that area. Okay. And uh, some of them get over that, are able to get over that and with the nerve sparing. Now, can techniques. I just ask you something? What does a prostate actually do if they can remove it? Remove it? What is it? What's its job in your body to start with? Well, one of its jobs, as far as I'm aware, is to uh, provide the, the fluid in ejaculate for... Um, the seminal fluid, I mean. The seminal fluid, yeah. that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's important for that. It probably has some other functions as well, but uh, that's the major one that I'm aware of. Okay, and by removing the prostate, does that like that, that? That's not some like magic bullet that fixes the problem, or it does, or like what? what well, how how big a, an, uh, an in, influence is it by removing the prostate? In many cases, it does solve the problem. Right. Um, the, the numbers that I was quoted at the time were that I had an eighty or ninety percent chance of solving the problem. So, so, because one thing is like normally people end up, you know, progressing to what they call secondary cancers, where the cancer is spread to other parts of their system. So, what I'm getting at is, if the prostate's removed, does it mean if it's removed before it's spread to a secondary cancer, then then it's a fairly good, optimistic outcome? Or, but or if it's not, and it has spread, you know, it's it's not a good outcome. Or how does it work? I suppose. Sorry, if I could interject on this jump, I suppose that would depend on if they get all of the cancer. Or if any residual remains is left and it's spreads to the secondary well, I'm stage, saying when they take the organs. cancer out, that's one thing to take the whole prostate out. But if the prostate, if it's spread to other parts of the system through through, the blood, know, through, through blood or through other parts of the body, that, that, I mean, you tell us, I mean, you know yeah. better than I. Well, it, it it is in most cases it is a good way of getting rid of the cancer, and it's very successful to do it that way. Okay. Uh, unfortunately for me, in my case, uh, there obviously had been a spread beforehand even though all the margins were clean and everything looked great after the operation. When my PSA was checked a month or two later, it should have been near to zero, and it was still the same as what it was originally. So, so why now, does your body keep producing antigens if you don't have a prostate? Before you go, is there anything in your, like your life, like your diet or anything that will um, trigger it, or is it just a natural, it's just a hereditary thing that'll happen? And you don't know when. We, we believe that there's a lot of heredity involved in the whole thing. Okay. Uh, there are various theories about um, antioxidant type foods and things of that sort, which can be very helpful. And, Think, and prostate about... cancer is very uh, less frequent in some societies with different diets to our Western diet. Okay. Uh, so like, I think like Japanese with the sort of the higher omega-3 uh, fish Mediterra diets. Mediterranean diets, Japanese okay. diets, those sorts of things. But they tend to eat a lot of fish on the omega-3 yeah. oils. So, so what, about, what about naughty things that might influence? Like does, is there any link, for example, between smoking, having a higher incidence of prostate cancer, or, or no impact, or drinking, or these sort of things? I'm not 
particularly aware of those being connected. Okay. Uh, no, not really. So the guys on the panel are breathing, breathing a sigh of release. <laughs> Don't have to give up the beer and the cigarettes just yet, but I think you might have to for other reasons. You've got other parts of your body that don't like those particular things in your system. Yeah, no, exactly. no, no, could I think of the ox? You mentioned that uh, in, as in the case of incontinence, that that pretty much um, comes back to normal. But do you ever fully recover from it? I mean, does it go away completely or you just have to live with a... A bit of a problem. A bit of a problem. Most men basically get rid of most of the problem. Completely. When you have a prostate operation and a removal, you are in fact removing one of the sphincters that helps to control urine from the bladder. Right. And therefore, there is always a slightly increased risk of having problems in that area yeah. in the future. For myself, I, I don't really have a problem. If I'm doing a lot of very heavy work, or if I'm coughing a lot, I might have a tiny bit of problem. But, but I mean, uh, to me, this, I just, to me, the strange thing is, incontinence to me is not a big issue if you've had, like, if, if it means not having cancer, mm. having a continence problem, like, and not having cancer to me is like a small price to pay in return for having I, a longer diagnosis. I, I like personally that. find it to be a small problem. Yeah. Very, very small, very marginal. Yeah. Um, so do you have any final comments for Bill? Because as we've discussed, you know, some guys, in particular our panel, are very reticent to get tests. And when they do hear these stories, I guess it worries them, which makes them become a little bit more chicken about it. Uh, what, what do you say to people out there who are like the guys that typically won't go and get tested or have the digital exam and that sort of thing? Any comment? The first thing is, I think Colin indicated, is we have to, you have to be aware of your family history. Yeah. If you've got family history, then you're at a much increased chance of having a problem. Right. And it's very, very desirable to have the test done at a, a reasonably early age. So what age would you recommend? Four well, as, as Colin years? said, in your 40s for people who've got a, a family uh, potential Street. problem. Yeah. Had, had you um, had any, like, had you been going for regular prostate checks before this? This was your first thing? Not so. Uh, I think my GP had, in fact, uh, done a couple on the sly. Which <laughs> <laughs> on the sly. Got to love those GPs on and, the sly. And he got around to telling me about it when it went above the limit. Or okay. it as it was at that time and in my case uh, as I thought that was fine but in my case it was too late yeah. so I think it's important uh, uh, mm -hmm. you've got a reasonable number of men who are in their sort of 40s, 50s, early 60s who have been affected by this disease 